Well, it's good to see you this afternoon. I, uh, I told Kaz, I said, the closing speaker is the guy who's there to turn the lights out and to put the chairs up and everything because everybody's trying to beat the traffic. But uh, I, I'm glad that you're here. And I, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about a vision that leads to a venture. And uh, you can have a vision, but if you don't have a venture, then nothing ever works. Dale Moody said on his deathbed, if God is your partner, make your plans large. I have a picture in my office of Walt Disney and Billy Graham standing together on the, the grounds of Disneyland, and I use it to remind myself sometimes that if we could ever figure out how to have the creativity of the Disney Corporation and the passion for the loss of the Graham organization, we could win the world in a generation. I think the same thing applies to sports and to recreation. If we can ever figure out how to pull together our resources, our mind, our energy into the things that matter, and not just having arts and not just having uh, recreation, but having it for a purpose within our church to go outside of our church to make a difference for the kingdom, it would be amazing what God could do and the lives that could be changed. Most churches are plateaued or declining. Most churches are older. A lot of churches are dying. 19 churches every week will close their doors for the last time. And if we don't do something to start reaching this next generation, we're going to find that the church in America has no influence, no clout, no voice, and really doesn't understand what its purpose is. I think Jesus left us a great commission. He didn't leave it for us to debate about it. He left it for us to do something about it and to, and to share it. And so I don't believe this is a time for low living. I don't believe this is a time for uh, just gazing at what's right in front of you. I think it's a time for us to have a big picture. One of the images that I always try to keep in my mind is uh, when my kids were little, I was all, we had a pool in our backyard, and we were always in the shallow end of the pool. The problem is, as we get older, sometimes we still like playing in the shallow end of the pool. We don't want to go out into deep waters. We don't want to go out where it's risky. But I believe that what God wants to do is that God wants to do something in us and through us that is so big that if we don't depend on him, we will be public failures. I think that's where God wants to get us. And so I want to ask you to turn to Matthew 14 or look on your iPad or on your phone to Matthew 14 because we're going to look at a very familiar story today, the story of Peter walking on the water. And uh, as you're turning to that, let me just tell you a little bit uh, we have a, a sports park at Sherwood. Uh, we use part of our resources that we got from uh, facing the Giants and from uh, the gifts of our members. Uh, I can remember being out on this piece of land that's right behind our school. Our school's located nine miles from our church, and so we bought this school and for a song. It was going under, and we bought it. Uh, there was land behind it, farmland behind it, and so we were taking our people on tours of it. And it was 42 acres. And even as I was taking them on a tour of it, the guy that owned the 40 acres behind that was talking to our executive pastor and saying, you know, I might be interested in selling you 40 acres of my land. And so we have an 82-acre sports park. We call it Legacy Park. It's adjacent to our school and to our school athletic facilities. Uh, we have a baseball hub there uh, with four fields. We have... Uh, I think you can divide up our soccer fields, high school soccer fields, and make about 16 fields. We have thousands of people every week on that facility. And guess what? 80% of them don't have anything to do with Sherwood Baptist Church. They're from all over the area. They're from all over the region. These moms and dads and grandparents and kids that are out there playing, they're not members of Sherwood Baptist Church. Sherwood Baptist Church doesn't need an 82-acre sports complex for its members, but we need it to reach the community. And the hardest thing for us to convince the community of is that this is for you. We did this for you. We did this to provide a ministry to you. And so we do all our sports leagues out there and, and we do a lot of events out there. We'll go back tonight 
and tomorrow there'll be a group from Albany State University, which is a predominantly African-American university, and they will have over 100, I forgot how many it is, Chad, but they'll have 100, 150 kids out there with no dads at a fishing rodeo because we have a fishing pond. We have an equestrian center. We brought kids from the inner city out there and people in our church that have horses go out there and let these kids ride a horse. It may be the only time they ever ride a horse in their life. And we just bring them out there and let them enjoy life, teach them how to fish, teach them how to ride horses, plus play sports. Why? Because God gave us the land and the facility and the resources and the opportunity to do something for our community that they can never pay us back for. If you only do things for people that can pay you back for it, then I think you miss the point of what ministry is about. God has called us to minister to people that can't do anything for us. You realize that everybody that Jesus ministered to, they couldn't do anything for him. I mean, what are you going to do for God? He can call down angels. He can heal the sick. He can raise the dead. What are you going to do for him? The only thing you can do for him is to give your life to him and let him use you for, your, for his glory. And so we, we've got this situation in, in uh, Matthew chapter 14. And as you're looking at it, I just want you to see the context of it. Jesus has fed the 5,000. And so Jesus is in the feeding of the 5,000. You know, the disciples, uh, they were the first committee in the Bible because they, they wanted to send the people away. Because they came to Jesus and they said, you know, it's not time for our monthly business meeting, but we don't have the money in the budget. And uh, our chef is off this week on vacation. And so we can't possibly feed those people. So the easiest thing to do with people who are in need, Jesus, is just get them out of our way. Get rid of them. Send them away. And Jesus said, no, no, no. You go see what we got out here. And so they find a boy with five loaves and two fish. Now, the first miracle of that day is that boy hadn't eaten that lunch yet. You think about it. His mama sent him off. He's got a little lunch and he's still got it. Five loaves and two fish. So they go and they sit everybody down in groups of 50. And then they, Jesus blesses the food and he feeds them. And you know what that little boy thought? That little boy, I, this little boy, like any other little boy, he's standing there going, <laughs> Jesus got my lunch. My lunch. Oh, you other clowns out there, you ate yours. But I was spiritual enough that I kept mine, gave it to Jesus. And Jesus starts multiplying it, multiplying it, it starts feeding 100, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 people. A little boy looks at his friend and says, not my lunch. I don't know where that lunch came from, but that's not my lunch. You see, when God gets in on what we do, he multiplies it in ways that we can't take credit for it. Joe Lewis, the great boxer, said this, you only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough. You only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough. And so we get down to Matthew 14, and, and Jesus has sent the disciples out in the boat, uh, verses uh, 22 through 33. He sent the disciples out. He goes up to pray. And then at some point in the night, there's a storm. If you've ever been on the Sea of Galilee, storms can come through there very quickly. And it, it's just like in a bowl, and when the wind comes, it can... The waves can get nasty, and, and they're in a storm. And these are expert fishermen. These are guys that know what to do in a boat. And this storm is coming, and, it, and the Bible says that there was a shriek of terror. And it, the word there means that it was so loud, it could be heard above the wind and the waves, above the storm. And, the, and they look out, and they say, it's a ghost. It was Jesus coming, walking on the water to them. And you know the story. Jesus says to Peter, come, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. Now, I love this story because this story is a story of doing something impossible. Here's this little boy, and he learned something about Jesus that we all have learned or we need to learn. And that is, whatever you've got, give it to Jesus and trust him with the results. And so he's taken his little lunch and he's given it to Jesus and he's trusted him with the results. Now, Jesus puts them out to sea to send them to the other side. I believe that Simon Peter was the only one that learned the lesson of the feeding of the 5,000. 
Because if you read the Gospels, every time Jesus taught, he put his disciples into a lab situation. So Jesus did what any good professor does. There's a lecture and a lab. I mean, you can sit up and draw it. Here's the plays. Here's what we're going to run. Here's the offense we're going to run. That's the lecture. But you got to have the lab experience. You got to have a practice to see if they got the lecture. Did they understand what they were supposed to do? I mean, you've done it. I've done it. You sit there and you say, okay, we're going to run this play. And, you know, you're going to run it down and out. And the guy runs and out and he goes in. And the other team intercepts the ball. And then the coach meets the guys. He's coming to the sideline saying, what were you doing? You're supposed to do this. You know what he's doing? He said, you didn't listen to the lecture. You missed it. I put you in a lab situation and you failed the test. And so Peter has learned this lesson of the feeding of the 5,000. He has seen what God can do. There's a church in, uh, African-American church in Kansas City, and they have a motto inscribed on their wall that says, let us wake up, sing up, preach up, pray up, and pay up, but never give up, back up, let up, or hush up until the cause of Jesus Christ in this church and in the world is built up. So Peter learns this lesson of the feeding of the 5,000, and then you realize that the only way that God gets the glory is when you do something that you can't do on your own. Charles Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. He had such a photographic memory, he just preached out of the overflow on Sunday nights. And he read about 5,000 pages a week. But when Charles Spurgeon walked to the pulpit, he would walk up and he would mutter under his breath, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's bigger than balls and bats. It's bigger than fields. If the Holy Spirit doesn't get in on our ministries, we're no different than a secular organization. If God doesn't get in on what we do, then it is just about balls and bats and there's no life change and there's nothing eternal. And so they do this impossible thing. This boy sees his lunch change. He sees all that's going on because, because my efficiency without God's sufficiency is a deficiency. The seven last words of the flesh are, I will do it for you, Jesus. H have you all resigned from being in charge of the world? I have. I mean, you know, I realized a long time ago, Jesus didn't need me. He didn't need anything I do. He doesn't need my gifts. He doesn't need my talents. He doesn't need me. What he needs is my availability. And when, when I'm available to him, God gets the glory. Let me just tell you a quick story here. I got a call one day, and this guy calls me up, and he says, you know, Michael, you weren't the first choice. I said, okay. He said, you know, you weren't. You weren't God's first choice. I said, all right. Explain that to me. He said, well, he said, just kind of follow my logic here. I said, okay. He said, uh, you know, God started out in Hollywood and said, I, I need some Christians to make some movies. You believe there are Christians in Hollywood? Well, I know there are. I know a lot of them. And, and you believe there are? Yeah. Well, they said no. And so he, he went to Phoenix, and then he went to Dallas, and then he went to Memphis, and then he went to Atlanta. And finally, he got to the end of his rope, and he came to Albany, Georgia, the fourth poorest city in America that has dropped by 30,000 people in population in the 25 years that I've been pastor there. And he says, I need somebody to make a movie. And we said, okay. Can I tell you something? The world's first choice to make an influence would not be to go to Albany, Georgia to start it. Can, can I tell you something else? When God decided to start a recreation ministry that would influence this country and thousands of churches, the last place the world would have picked was Spartanburg, South Carolina. I mean, hey, he picked a guy that grew up in my youth ministry. That's enough baggage right there. I mean, he's been in counseling all of his life because of that. And then he comes out of college and he goes to First Spartanburg, and that's the only church he's ever worked in. And God lays a vision on Kaz's heart and says, I want you to do something. 
And Kaz just said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, God's, God's just looking for people that are available and want to give Him the glory and don't care who gets the credit. That's all God's looking for. Uh, when we were filming Courageous, uh, USA Today came down and they did a, a, a three-quarter page article on us. And on the movie, they were on set for a couple of days. And, and I was sitting down and doing this interview with this gal that does all the religion writing for uh, USA Today. And she said, why do you do what you do? I said, we use entertainment to change lives. We are not a church that stands up and curses the darkness and complains about the darkness. We decided to turn some lights on. Now, you know, we can complain about, you know, kids are involved in sports and their coach, coaches cuss at them and their dads berate them and everything else. Or we can turn the light on and do something that the world can't explain. And not only can the world not explain it, the world asks, how do you do that? And we want to know about that. We want to know about what you're doing. So I want to give you four quick principles on doing something big for God in your church, in your recreation ministry, in your youth ministry, whatever area you're representing. I want to give you four principles for what to do uh, just to get out of the boat. Number one, don't give counsel to your detractors. Don't give counsel to your detractors. Every church has somebody in it whose attitude is, as long as I'm in this church, there will never be a unanimous vote. You know them. I see they're in your church too. Don't give counsel your, to your detractors. Don't give counsel to the people that say, you know, the last guy that tried that, he's not here anymore. Oh, we tried that. It won't work. I heard of another church that tried that. Didn't work for them. Won't work for us. Uh, we're going to need to take that to a committee, which means it goes to the death cell. It's not in the budget. You can't do that. We've never done that. It's not in the Constitution and bylaws. Somebody tried that and they failed. We will fail. What will people think about us? What if we do this? What if we do that? And there are always these detractors that are always pulling on you and saying, you don't want to do that. You see, we talk a lot about getting outside the box. Walt Disney said, you're assuming there's a box. You know, you're not going to get outside of the box if you play it safe all the time. Now, here's the way that I deal with distractors. If, God, if I believe God's given me an idea, and by the way, there's a big difference between a good idea and a God idea. But if I believe God's given me an idea, what I go to is I go to boundaries. And my boundaries are the Word of God. Let's just take baseball, for instance. A guy can hit a ball 550 feet, but if it's on the wrong side of the foul line, it's just a long walk back to home plate and a free ball for some fan. There are boundaries that tell you if a ball's in play or not. There are boundaries that tell you you've got to get one foot in bounds in college, you've got to get two feet in bounds in the pros, or it's not a catch. Great throw, great reception, out of bounds. There are boundaries in basketball. There are boundaries in soccer. I mean, you, you've got lines drawn. Well, the Word of God is our boundary. We talked this morning about sports and recreation and Sunday and all of that. Whatever the idea is, the only boundary we should have is the Word of God. I mean, the Pharisees put up boundaries that kept the people from coming to Christ. And so Christ went around them. And what we have to do sometimes is some of our detractors are not the people outside the church that need Jesus. They're the people inside the church that think they have a corner on Jesus and he shouldn't be shared with anybody else. So we've got to see what the boundaries are. I mean, when I went to Sherwood, it was legalistic. I mean, I'm talking about legalistic. I'm talking about seriously legalistic. I mean, you couldn't clap. Clapping was a sin. I started clapping and we had 14 coronaries right there in the, in the middle of the service. <laughs> Women couldn't wear pants, not even to come and bring your tithe on a Tuesday. 
I told him, I said, you can come in a bikini if you're bringing your tithe. I don't care. I mean, if you're a tither, come any way you want. But I had to preach for a year out of the book of Galatians to say, it's not about what you think or what this guy said. What does the Bible say? Give me chapter and verse that tells me that this is outside of the Word of God, the Spirit of Christ, the attitude of Christ, and the expansion of the Great Commission. And if you can show me that, besides I just don't like it, or it's traditional, or we've never done it that way before, then we'll talk about it. But your boundary, you have boundaries in recreation, figure out that your boundary is the Word of God. You're always going to have detractors. You're always going to have people that tell you you can't. I mean, my biggest detractor was my pastor growing up. When I went into the ministry, my pastor said to me, Michael, you're never going to amount to much. He had the spiritual gift of discouragement. I mean, he just, I mean, he just flat put me down. He said, you're never going to amount to much. And I could have said right there, well, you know, this guy's my pastor. He's told me I'm not going to amount to much. I guess I'm not going to amount to much. And now just use your sanctified imagination in this text. Here comes Jesus walking on the water. Peter's about to get out of the boat and walk on the water. He says, if it's you, Lord, bid me come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And so Peter starts to get out of the water. And let's just use a little sanctified imagination here. Matthew says, uh, 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 Peter, do, do you have life insurance policy? And, and Thomas says, you know, rationally, this is impossible. <laughs> Nobody's ever done this except Bear Bryant, and, I, and it's just impossible. <laughs> and Andrew goes, huh, what am I going to tell Mom? You're always going to have detractors. I mean, there are, there are going to always, just don't ever think it's going to be perfect. There are always going to be people in your life who are going to try to put you down, poke a hole in your balloon, tell you that you can't do it. Marshall Sheely in his book, Well-Intentioned Dragons, said they will accuse you of being too spiritual, not spiritual enough, too dominant, too laid back, too narrow, too loose, too structured, too disorganized, or having ulterior motives. Never let a loser tell you how to win. Never let a loser tell you how to win. You know, if, if you want to win in sports, you don't go find a guy that's never won a ball game and say, hey, you want to be our coach? You go find a guy that knows how to win. I, I just spent, uh, two weeks ago, I just spent three days with the Ole Miss football team and, and at practices, two team meetings, FCA meeting and, and a coaches meeting. And their theme for this year, and I've got it on, their theme for this year is All In. The coaching staff read the book by Mark Batterson, All In. And their theme is All In. And, to, and to, on the day of the commitment, every player and every coach had to walk up and say to Hugh Freeze, Coach, I'm all in. I've bought into the vision. I understand it. I get it. I want to do it. I'm willing to pay the price. I'm all in. And I was standing over the side with Ken Smith, and everybody got through, and he looks at us and says, were you guys in or not? So I walked up. I had to look the coach in the eye, and then I had to go down the line. With the defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator, backs coach, everybody had to go down the line and say, I'm all in. So I, so I wear this to remind me that if you're not all in, why are you in in the beginning? And if we're not all in for the gospel, if we're not all in to reach kids, we ought to go do something else because it's too hard. You're working with volunteers. I mean, if they were paid, you could slap them around. But, you know, you're working with volunteers, and they just look at you and go, I don't want to do that. you got to find people who are all in. So the first thing is don't give counsel to your distractors. Second thing is don't give counsel to your circumstances. I mean, they're in a storm. Peter's in a boat. And he gets out of the boat, and it says, but seeing the wind... You can't see the wind. You can see the effects of the wind. You can see leaves blowing. You can see trees moving. 
You know, you can see the effects of the wind, but you can't see the wind unless you get your eyes off Jesus. And he saw the wind, and he began to sink. You see, circumstances are never right for believing God. The enemy or your detractors are always going to tell you why you don't need to believe God. Now, just think about it. Think about these circumstances. Alexander the Great conquered the world and he never took a leadership class. Shakespeare, the greatest writer in history, he never had a typewriter. Newt Rockne, the legendary coach of Notre Dame, never won an NCAA championship. Not one of the disciples had a best-selling book and none of them were ever on TBN. Paul never made it as Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Martin Luther was considered a heretic by his peers. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress, which is the second largest selling book in history outside the Bible. He wrote it in a prison. The work of God is never dependent on circumstances. I mean, if we had planned the coming of Jesus, we would have planned it when he could have had a Twitter account. And he could have done selfies with all the disciples. Here by the Sea of Galilee. See how many followers he's got. We would have planned it when it was better. But the Bible says in the fullness of time he came. Why? Because God knows the best time. Not us. Circumstances don't seem right to do things. I, I just told you. We're in the fourth poorest city in America. We're number 10 in identity theft. We just finished a $25 million project. We're planting churches in eight cities in America. We have a missionary through the International Mission Board that we pay all of his salary and his expenses who's reaching the Dutch in Germany, which are 99.9% .9 unchurched. Our adopted country is Cuba. We have a group leaving this next week to go to uh, Holland, and we have a group leaving in a few weeks to go to Cuba. We could sit down and say, you know, we're the fourth poorest city in America. We just need to sit here and sing, hold the fort till Jesus comes. But in the midst of all of that, we've built an 82-acre sports complex, and we've done the ministries that we've done that are far more reaching than I can ever explain to you because some people believed God for impossible things. Our people were willing to do whatever God told them to do. And by the way, you don't create that outside of a prayer environment. You don't create that with a poster, a brochure, or a meeting right after church. You create that in a prayer environment. So don't get your eyes on your circumstances, on what's going on around you. It may be you don't have the facility, find one. It may be that you don't have the funds, find a way. Thirdly, don't attempt it in your flesh. Jesus said, come. Jesus said, come. Now that's a very quick one and easy one. Don't move until Jesus says move, but when Jesus says move, you better get up and get going. You better do what he tells you to do. Last one. The obvious one. Get out of the boat. I mean, at some point you got to get out of the boat. I remember when we announced that we were going to do a movie and we made Flywheel for $20,000. And we made it so that our members would have a tool to give to their neighbors for Easter as an outreach tool, as a witnessing tool. So we shot it for $20,000. It's a cheap movie. You look at it, you know it's a cheap movie. But it's got a, it's got a great story. It's my favorite story of, of the four that we've done. My favorite one. But... We made that movie as an outreach tool when we did Facing the Giants. We were, in, we were in three theaters with Flywheel. And to be in three theaters with Flywheel, here's what it means. It means we took a DVD player and projector and we hooked it up, moved the film projector over in the movie theater and hit the play button. There was no previews of anything else. I mean, it was up and then it was over and it was off. And so our goal was to get in 12 movie theaters with Facing the Giants. And then Sony picked it up, Provident picked it up. We went in 400 theaters, started with that. The last three movies have all been in the top 10 movies on opening weekend. Uh, two of them have been in top 10 past opening weekend. And we've been able to go into 140 countries around the world 
they're translated into multiple languages. Can I tell you something? If you don't get out of the boat, you never see those kind of things happen. If I was just going to be the pastor of a Baptist church in Albany, Georgia, we would have never done that. But God gave me a great commission. And that means we've got to do whatever it takes to reach the world with the gospel. So I'm sitting in my office one day, and all of a sudden I get this picture on my phone. And it's from a Secret Service agent in our church who guards Jimmy Carter. Why Jimmy Carter needs a guard, I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe to protect us from him. Uh, <laughs> go back to peanuts. Uh, <laughs> I get a picture and fireproof is being shown in primetime television in Beirut, Lebanon as he sends that to me. It's been shown in Amman, Jordan. All of our movies have been on the Turkish Airlines, which is owned by Muslims. And three months ago, Courageous was shown on the only television network in all of Cuba. Courageous was shown in primetime, so if anybody in the nation of Cuba was watching TV that night, they got one option, and that was courageous. Now, I want to tell you something. If I had operated like a typical Southern Baptist pastor, and if the members of Sherwood Baptist Church had operated like a typical Southern Baptist church, we would still be having committee meetings trying to figure out if we're going to do anything. We still would. But at some point, you do something so big that if God's not in it, you're a failure. Can I tell you, I have walked into convention meetings, I've walked into conferences, and I've had people walk up to me and say, you know, when I heard you were doing that, I thought you were the stupidest person that ever walked the face of the earth. That's fine. You know what? We do what we do, whether it's recreation or arts or preaching or teaching or mission trips or whatever it is. Folks, if we don't do what we do for an audience of one, we're doing it for the wrong reason. We do it for an audience of one. And if God's pleased, it doesn't matter. We had some movie critics on the set, and uh, this critic sat down with me and he said, you know, he said, a lot of us think because you won't show your movies to us that, that uh, it's because they're cheesy. I said, no, that's not the reason at all. We don't show your movie to you because your title says you're a critic. I mean, why do I want to throw myself out in front of a critic? It doesn't say you're, you're a movie evaluator, you're a movie connoisseur. It says you're a movie critic. That's what your card says. You're a critic. So why do I care what you think? He said, well, you should care what I think. I said, I really don't. And our PR people are sitting there going, don't, don't say those kind of things. Say those kind of things. But you know what it gave me the opportunity? It gave me the opportunity to say this guy. Let me tell you something. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for me and gave his life for me and called me into ministry, he called me to do things that this world will not understand. And you may never understand what we're doing, but what we do, we do for Jesus Christ and we do it for his glory. And whether you like it or not, it doesn't really matter to us. We would like for you to like it. We would like for you to enjoy it. We would like for you to say some nice things about it. But even if you don't, we're still going to do what God's told us to do. And this is what it is. this was his response. Why? Because you get out of the boat. You get out of the boat. Uh, let, me, let me just give you an illustration here. Derek Johnson is a, a friend of mine. He's a friend of Chuck Wallington's. He's one of the most creative people that God ever put on this planet. Uh, if, if you've ever been to Disney, the reason there's a show on the stage in front of Cinderella Castle is because Derek Johnson started that show. If you've ever been to Epcot and you've been to Christmas Spectacular and uh, two million people or more, I don't know how many people have seen it, but they've had a show there for 30 years. They do a Christmas program. They read the Christmas story. They do one solitary life, and they end with the Hallelujah Chorus. Only place on Disney property where you hear the gospel, but you hear it there. Derek Johnson started all that. Derek Johnson was a creative consultant with Walt Disney for 30 years. And so when the millennium came up, 
they were having a meeting of about 16 people at Disney Corporate out in California. They were having a meeting about how can we celebrate the millennium. And one guy says, well, we can do fireworks. We do fireworks every night. I mean, they spend 100000 a night on each park. Each park is $100,000 worth of fireworks. It costs $1.2 million just to turn the lights on at Disney World so you can walk in and your kids can cry and complain. So he said, you know, we can do fireworks. Let me tell you how good Disney is at what they do. Because I believe the church ought to be excellent in what it does. Now, excellence on whatever it means for you, whatever level that is, it needs to be excellent. When we made a $100,000 movie, we wanted it to be excellent. When we built these new buildings, we wanted them to be excellent. Because too many people do things in the name of Jesus and ask the world to accept junk. Well, we didn't clean it, and it's not very good, and nothing works, but we did it for Jesus. I don't think that's acceptable. So, Disney is so good at fireworks that they own a patent on doing a musical staff. Now, I know you're all sports people, so you don't understand anything about a musical staff, but there are these lines that go across. If you've ever seen a hymnal, there are these lines that go across like this. <laughs> and I got these notes that go up and down. They can do eight measures of a song in the sky 150 feet above the park in sync with the music on the ground. And you thought a three-pointer was tough. So they're talking about fireworks and what are we going to do? You know, this is the millennium. None of us are going to be around for the next millennium. We've got to do something big. I mean, it's got to be big. It's got to be something we've never done before. And we're, we're Disney World. We're known for excellence. And, you know, we've got all these opportunities and we've got the money and the resources and, and the world's going to be looking at us and, and people are going to be here to experience this day with us. And what are we going to do with all that we've got? And Derek said that there was one of their creative people and he was sitting at that table and he could tell he was getting so frustrated because he had all these dreams and visions about what they could do to celebrate the millennium. And he said he jumped up, he hit the table, and he said, we need a bigger sky. <laughs> Can I tell you something? We need bigger sky thinking in the church. I guarantee you, I promise you, that when Upward started, built their first building, built their production distribution, built this facility, there were people in this town saying, who in the world would build anything like that here? Why would you do that? You know why? Because they don't even have a horizon, much less a sky. And you cannot run your life and you cannot run your ministry and you cannot change the world from your community if you don't have a bigger sky. You and I need a bigger sky because our God is a creative God. Our God gives ideas that this world can't even begin to understand. And we don't need to be outthought by people that have no connection to the God who put it all together. We need to be the best thinkers. We need to be the best planners. We need to be the best recreation people. We need to be better than anybody else in our towns and in our communities because we've got a God who made a big sky. Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus that these men and women, no matter what size their church, no matter their denomination, no matter their background, wherever they are, wherever they've come from, whatever obstacles they face, whatever distractions they have, whatever critics they might have, I pray, Father, that in the name of Jesus that you would do something great in every church, every ministry, every community represented here, that you would do something kingdom-minded. Father, we would not worry about protecting our turf or our reputations with our goal and our passion and our dream and our purpose would be to bring glory to Jesus Christ, to bring the lost into the kingdom, to disciple the saved, and to prepare a world for the coming of Christ. 
Lord, we bless your name for what you do and who you are and what you can do and will do through available people. Lord, you're calling people in this room to get out of their boat. And they may be surrounded by others that are rowing and questioning and doubting. But God, somebody in this room needs to get out of their boat. And they need to take a step toward you because it is safer on the water with you than it is in the boat without you. And so God, I pray that you would lay big dreams and big plans and big visions on the hearts of the men and women in this room. And that you would do something that the world cannot ignore. That you would create something in those communities, in those ministries that impacts lives of people who aren't even thinking church, aren't even thinking about the church and recreation tied together. This is not even on their radar screen right now, but by your grace and by your work and by your power, you'll call some people out of here that'll do great things, greater things, greater works, because they've trusted you, they've heard your voice, and they're not afraid to get out of the boat. For I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.